Hi guys, I'm glad you're tuning in with me today. Hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's video, I'll be answering some community questions, talking about Ethereum staking, Rocket Pool, and a few other questions. So I'm sure you'll find this video valuable. My name is Kieran, I create DeFi and crypto videos to make sure that you are ready for the next bull run. Let's start with Nick P. He asked a question on my last video talking about Ethereum 2.0 staking pool with Rocket Pool. And his question is, I think there's a real problem here with locking up your coins. I don't just mean with ETH, I mean with all coins that can be staked currently. My personal dilemma is, I didn't want to lock away my coins for a year in such a volatile market. Not being able to sell if things go wrong or the market crashes, it brings on a bit of anxiety. I know you said they're working on a way to make this possible, but what happens if a lot of people panic at the same time and want to withdraw their ETH? I actually prepared another answer. However, I found a new update post on Medium by Rocket Pool, and it's actually very interesting. With the new update, they are introducing a new ARIF token that allows people to have more or less liquidity when locking up their ETH for staking. So I'll read what their update is and it's called tokenized staking deposits. When a user deposits into the Rocket Pool network, they will instantly receive the RETH token, which represents a tokenized staking deposit and the rewards it gains over time in the Rocket Pool network. It's actually really interesting. This RETH token at the beginning, it's backed one by one, but over time, this RETH token will gain in value. That means, at the beginning, if you pay one ETH, you'd get one RETH token. But maybe after a year, this RETH token will be worth 1.1 ETH because all the staking rewards will be added to this ERC20 token. I think this is a great, it opens a lot of new possibilities. This RETH token can be maybe used in MakerDAO and Compound Finance and many different other decentralized applications. Maybe it might also be possible to just buy this RF token with ETH and not really be bothered with the whole um, locking up your ETH in a staking pool. I think what's also very important about this token is that this token does not need to be locked within the network to gain rewards and it can be traded, sold or held as the user desires all from the moment the deposit ETH for staking. This token can be instantly be used in decentralized finance apps and allows DEXs uh, wallets the ability to offer instant staking services. I think this is super, super powerful because in the end, you only have to be have to buy this ESC20 token, this RETH, and you will be, already be gaining staking rewards. And I think this is gonna be super valuable. I hope this answers your question and your dilemma about locking your ETH for a longer period of time because the RETH enables liquidity, allows you to um, sell your RETH for ETH and more or less exit the staking whenever you want. Let's continue with another great question by Drag Spirit. I'll read this question. Great again, thanks a lot for your work. What would you recommend if I own more than 32 ETH? Should I use my own node or just go with a staking pool? I think you have to ask yourself the following question. Do you want to work and install and maintain a validated client on your own? Or do you want to go with a staking pool and pay a fee, but not really have to worry about the technical aspect of running a validator, making sure it's online all the time? There is another aspect to it, and that is the ability to remove your ETH from the deposit contract. If you have validator on the Ethereum 2.0 blockchain, you won't be able to remove your ETH. And now with the new information that I got from Rocket Pool, using a staking pool might actually be a lot more useful to people because even though they're paying a fee, they can lock up their ETH, but they will get this RETH token back that gains in value. And this RF token can be sold at any point in time, which adds a lot more value to using a staking pool because you've got this added liquidity that you wouldn't have otherwise when installing a validator client and staking on the Ethereum 2.0 blockchain on your own without a staking pool. 
Let's continue with the next question by Felix Wölfle. The interest on ETH is super low. Is it then worth the risk to lend out my coins? I think this is a great question and it's uh, on my video. What is compound finance? The best way to earn interest or borrow with DeFi. I believe uh, compound finance uh, lending is only good for stable coins. Only with stable coins will you get a pretty good APR. And with ETH, it's pretty low. With ETH, BTC, and other cryptocurrencies, it's actually pretty low. I think maybe 0 0.5 or 1% APR. So I don't think it's worth it to lend cryptocurrencies apart from the stable coins on compound finance. Now, hopefully soon you'll be able to do it on the Ethereum 2.0 blockchain with maybe a staking pool where the APR is definitely a lot more lucrative than lending your ETH on compound finance. So we've got a good question by Marbu on the video. Ethereum 2.0 validator launchpad reasons for the DLA and Ethereum. And his question is, how can we keep up with the Prism updates when uh, Validator and Beacon Node are running? Also, not a static IP would be a problem when running these two pieces of software. A very good question. As long as you've got the same public and private key, it doesn't really matter what kind of IP you've got. To update the Prism Validator client and the Beacon Node, it's actually really easy. As soon as there's a new a Prism Validator client update, the only thing you have to do is run the GitHub pool command to get the validator client uh, from github and it will get the newest version automatically so follow along either on the linux guide or the mac guide where i show how you can get the either the installation script command from both of those and if you perform that it will update the prism validator client and then you just have to run it again make sure that the beacon node is uh, synchronized you don't really have to worry about being penalized during that time because the penalties are very low unless you're going to submit or propose for a block. But even then, the penalties are going to be really low. As long as you're not offline for several days at a time, the penalties are going to be actually pretty low. So I've got a good question by Kami MCT. Hi, Kieran. Thank you for the great material as always. How do we get the rewards from staking? Is it on a daily basis like other staking or monthly? How do we receive the interest? Does it go directly to our wallet? Can we use a private server if we don't want to keep our computer online? What a fantastic question. And yeah, it's quite understandable that it's not that clear how often the staking rewards get paid out and where they get paid out to. As a short answer, your validator staking rewards are added to your validator deposit every 6.4 minutes. If you want to see your staking rewards and your total validator deposit, what you can do is take your public key, go into Beacon Chain, so it's beaconchain.in, and you can input your public key and then there you will see your daily, weekly, and monthly earnings. Now for the question, if you can use a private server, what you can do is you can sign up to Amazon Web Services. You get one of their packages with Linux installed on it. And on that VPS, you can install the validator client and the beacon node. And I think that's a great way to go. If you don't really want to focus on the hardware side of things, you just want to run your validator client and make sure it's online nearly 100% of the time. So yeah, then you can just go with a VPS and not have your computer running 24 seven. Let's continue with the next question by Kerven. Thanks for the video on how to set up to become a validator. New to this, so some questions. What do we need to do after running the beacon and validator scripts? do nothing or need to vote on something. If there's internet or power disruption, how do we restart the script? Open a command prompt and run prism.sh for both beacon and validator client. Yeah, thanks. So actually really great question. It might not be clear when watching the video. To answer it, the first part, you don't really have to do anything. As soon as the validator client and the beacon chain are running, you just can leave your computer powered on running both of these terminals and the validation process will happen on its own. You don't have to do anything manually. Now, if you go offline, you get a penalty. If you go offline, you get a penalty. Now I did make a video about how high these penalties are. I'll link it up here so you can check that out. Basically, your penalty is gonna be the amount that you'll be earning per year 
is the amount that you'd be losing if you were online for the same period of time. To answer your question about restarting your validator client and your beacon node, it's actually pretty easy. You just have to run the Prism script for both of these, for the beacon and the validator client. Now, if you're offline for a longer period of time, it's possible that it might take a bit of time to synchronize the beacon node with the beacon chain. So you have to wait for that to happen. Next up, a uh, great question by Ryland Harris. Hi, super awesome video, bro. I'm new to the crypto community and I had a couple of questions. Hopefully you can answer. If you want to be a validator, is a financial benefit to participating in a test period? Or can we theoretically just wait until the actual rewards kick in? And what happens if the hardware you designated as your validator breaks? Does that matter? So I think this is actually a very, very good question. To answer that, no, there's no financial benefit. All the ETH that is used there is Tesla ETH, girly ETH, and it has no real world value. So the only intrinsic value that people get from participating in the testnet is to understand how to run their validator client, how to run the beacon node, and make sure that they can keep it online for as long as possible. And if they actually discover some bugs and make mistakes, they don't actually risk some real world ETH. And I think that's the added value I think the second reason why it's great for people to participate is the more people participate, the more bugs are found. It will help the different development teams, the Prismatic Labs team to fix these bugs and make sure that the Prism validator client works without any hiccups. Now to answer the second question, which I think is pretty good. I haven't seen this question asked before and this what happens if the hardware you designate as your validator client breaks? Does that matter? It actually does matter a lot because if your hardware breaks, then your validator client will be offline and you'll be incurring quite a lot of penalties. Now what you should do when you install your validator client is make sure that your private key is saved in a secure location. You can copy your whole prison folder to a secure location, maybe in the cloud or an external hard drive. For example, your SSD storage breaks, you can replace that with another SSD storage and you copy your folder from your external hard drive onto that SSD and then you can run the validator client and the beacon node again from the new SSD storage and hopefully the downtime is going to be minimal and that's how you do it. Next question is by Donald Huang. Great tutorial, thank you. Under my app data, there are two key files. The content is long. What portion of this file is my public key exactly? I tried various sections to search on the Beacon Explorer. They are all invalid public keys. Also, do I need to keep these two terminals open for the validators to function? Much obliged. Now, this, this, this question was asked on my first video, Prism ETH to testnet. And the thing that you have to realize with that is that that video, I'm using the Sapphire testnet, which is old and currently the Prismatic validator clients are running on the new Topaz testnet. So if you created a public key on the Sapphire testnet, it won't be the same. It won't actually be valid on the Topaz testnet. That's the first point. The second is, in order to find the validator public key, you, when you run your validator client in the terminal and you're connected, you see a little piece of information that says public key with several characters, numbers and letters. And that's your public key. I'll put a picture up so you can see what it is. And that public key you can then put into the Beacon Chain website and you can monitor your validator client. To answer the last question, do I need these two terminals open for the validator to function? And the answer is yes. You need to have the, the beacon node open to be able to sync the beacon node with the beacon chain, the data that you've got in your computer with the beacon chain always has to be up to date. And then afterwards, you've got the validator client that proposes blocks and votes for new blocks. So both of these terminals have to be open at all times. And if they're not open, and the beacon node is not synced, then the validator client won't work and you'll get some penalties for being offline. All right, now let's uh, go away a little bit from uh, staking and I've got a great question by Blue Room Productions and that's about buying RPL. 
But this is also uh, useful for any type of tokens that you want to buy either on one inch exchange or Uniswap. So I'll read this question. Thanks so much for providing this info, Kieran. I tried to follow the instructions in your last video to exchange some E for RPL coins using the one inch exchange and my Ledger Nano S. However, when I try to finish and click swap now, I keep getting an error message. Exchange rates were expired and now updated. Please try again or set a higher price slippage limit. I keep getting that error message no matter how quickly I click on swap now. And no matter how high I set the max price slippage, any ideas? Well, I actually had this happen to me a while ago and I wasn't really sure why. And I found the reason and the reason is low liquidity. If you don't have a lot of sellers for a particular token, then you have some trouble when buying larger amounts of a certain token on either one inch exchange or Uniswap. And RPL is actually a pretty new token and not many people are willing to sell it. And if not many people are willing to sell it, it's gonna be difficult to buy. So you've got different options that you can try here. You can either try and buy a lower amount of tokens and see if that works. You try and decrease the amount of tokens that you're willing to buy. Or you can also try and use the Uniswap exchange to maybe see if there it's possible to buy a certain amount or actually try it at a different um, time or day now, I wouldn't suggest to change the max price slippage because if you change the max price slippage, what that means is that you'll be buying tokens at a much higher price. Try and buy a smaller amount, try at a different time. And that's the two suggestions I have. That's what I did and I managed to buy the tokens over several days because if you want to buy a lot, it's possible that there's just not enough liquidity available for that particular token. The last question of today's video, and I think it's actually a very interesting question. It's again about the RPL token. This question is by Mariano Bertoles, and he asks, Hi, I did it with MetaMask Wallet, but I do not see that one inch has sent me the funds, and he means the RPL tokens. What happened? I think MetaMask does not support MetaMask. How can I get my tokens back? I think he means here, I think one inch that exchange does not support metamask how can i get my tokens back and it's actually quite interesting with metamask i'm not particularly a fan of metamask because it's not very user friendly and the thing is with rpl tokens since they're actually pretty new you have to add these rpl tokens manually i link down in the description below an article that explains how you can actually add these rpl tokens manually but I'll go through it with you as it's actually quite uh, easy and fast process. So what you have to do is open up the MetaMask wallet, log in, click on the menu, then at select add token. Then afterwards you have to click on custom tokens and you enter the RPL contract address. I'll post it here and you also find it down below. Now afterwards what you have to do is add tokens then you click on the menu again and then you switch from Ether to RPL and MetaMask will now display the RPL balance in your account. Then what you can do is click the send button under your balance and follow the prompts to send your RPL to another address. If you want to do that, you will need to have some ETH on your account to be able to send ERC20 tokens to another Ethereum wallet. In my opinion, I think it's a bit unnecessary to have to do all these steps. That's why I'd suggest to use another wallet. I really enjoy using the Trust Wallet. I made two videos about that. I'll link it here. And I think it's actually really useful because in the Trust Wallet, when I get some RPL or other ESC20 tokens, I don't have to manually add these tokens to the wallet. They are just displayed automatically. And if you're not sure if you received the funds, what you can do is you can open up your Ethereum wallet in the Ether scan and you can look under tokens and you see which tokens, which ESC20 tokens that you have received. So you can see if the transaction went through successfully. So that was today's video. I hope you enjoyed this short Q&A and yeah, I'll probably be doing this again. If you've got questions, just leave them down below each video. I'll be sure to answer them in the next Q&A session. With that said, I wish you a fantastic day and I'll catch you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.